Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah, and I'm here with Stephanie. And today we are going to be talking about food addiction. This is a big, quite a controversial subject in many ways. First of all, do you know what the DSM-5 says about addiction? Do you know how it defines addiction? Addiction isn't in the DSM-5 because it's too difficult to define. Mm. So alcoholism Hmm. is alcohol use disorder and gambling is in the DSM-5, but it's not gambling Mm -hmm. addiction. It's just called gambling disorder. They've got rid of the word addiction because it's- Yeah, because it used to be in there. Yeah, it's too problematic. It's too problematic. So when people are talking about food addiction, what does that even mean? We say addicted to food, but are we talking about certain types of food, first of all? Because most people who would call themselves food addicts, it's not all foods that they have addictive relationships with. So then people start talking about sugar addiction or processed Processed foods. That's another one. Um, And the like. Yeah, well, I find this to be mostly a conversation I have with people with a history of orthorexia and clean eating. Um, And I also fully uh, supported that. In fact, I used to teach about it. I used to talk to people about the evils of the food industry and that they were, you know, just sort of this conspiracy theory of sugar. We were being made to be addicted to food and it was our moral responsibility to gain awareness on that and fight for moving back to more wholesome foods and the traditions of our ancestors who never had massive supermarket chains and all these processed foods. And I saw very clearly at one time, I really believed in that. This is a theory that has science too behind it. So I'll have a lot of people ask me, well, how can you fight this science about this? So how do we tease this out? And Mm -hmm. what is your opinion? What is what do you think about it? Firstly, when I see people putting on social media, food addiction is not real. You know, it's not a thing. And they state that as a fact. It's not a thing. And you can't prove a negative. That's the thing. It's very difficult to prove that something doesn't exist. So there's already a challenge there on both sides. I think when it comes to food addiction, first of all, we have to talk about, we have to ask what we're actually talking about here. And are we talking about it as a substance addiction, like the sugar, like the processed foods? Or are we talking about it as a behavioral addiction, like gambling? Because in Mm. theory, it's possible to get addicted to anything or to have addictive like behaviors around anything that stimulates the reward pathways in the brain. And we know that these certain foods do. The question then becomes, so people might be hearing this and going, oh, so Sarah thinks food addiction is real. Well, if we're saying food addiction is real, what I'm interested in is the question is, well, now what? What does that actually mean in terms of what do we do about it? Now, you and I have both spent time in Overeaters Anonymous, and I don't think we've ever really spoken about that on the podcast. So that Mm. might be an interesting Mm. place to kind of begin of our experience of trying to follow an addiction model. So for me, I spent seven months in Overeaters Anonymous. For people who don't know what that is, it's a 12-step program like Alcoholics Anonymous. So it takes the same principles for alcohol addiction and translates that over to food. And as with alcohol addiction, with alcohol, if you follow a 12 step model, you don't drink, you give up alcohol, you become sober. And the same thing happens with food. You have to give up any behaviors that are, or any foods that are part of the addiction. And where most people get pushed to with Overeaters Anonymous is around sugar and white flour. So they have these food sheets, which is basically how to eat without having any sugar or white flour. There'll be some pushback on this because I know that different meetings have different levels of strictness around this. And a lot of meetings actually allow people to define what their own abstinence is. 
my issue when it comes to something like food that we need to survive is that we're going to be triggering off a restriction response a lot of the time, which doesn't necessarily happen with something like alcohol or gambling in the same way. So I think it's extremely problematic when for a lot of people who start struggling with binge eating, restrictions been what's got them there in the first place. What I tended to see in OA was the people that seemed to quote unquote do well with the program seemed to be people that came from a restricted eating background because you've got people with bulimia and people with anorexia in Overeaters Anonymous as well, which might surprise some people. It's basically a range of all eating disorders there and food anxieties. I found that Overeaters Anonymous perpetuated the black and white thinking. And what I needed in order for me to recover and to find peace was to actually discover the gray. That's what I needed. There are people out there who will swear that this has worked for them. And to those people, I'm like, okay, that's worked for you. Some people will be very dismissive of that and they'll just be like, you know, no, it's not. They're just in a diet mentality. But I think we need to be very careful when we make assumptions around what's going on for other people, what's going on in other people's brains when it comes to this. Yeah. I do see that model as a way of putting in rules. I mean, it is, it's, it's mm-hmm. putting in rules. And if you're someone who rebels physically or psychologically against those rules, this won't work and you'll feel broken. But there's cases of people who need rules. <laughs> and maybe that feels, maybe that black and white feels good and works. I think that's less often the case with people who are struggling with binge eating that I have seen in my own experience. What I always just come back to on this is, and first of all, I think it was probably the most important thing of this entire episode is what you said in the beginning of the difference between, are we talking about addiction as a, to a substance versus to a behavior? Because those are different concepts. And I believe that I was addicted to a behavior to a degree, sure, but not to the substance. And maybe there are people who, I don't know, again, I, you can't prove it. I also don't have a predisposition to, to um, high blood sugar or diabetes. Like I, my, my genetic makeup is such that that has always been really stable for me. And maybe there's people for whom there's more of a sensitivity to certain kinds of foods. Okay. However, when I went to OA and I was off limits, the very first thing, frozen yogurt. I mean, this was during the nineties and I used to go to frozen yogurt shops and binge on frozen yogurt all the time. (laughs) Like that was my thing. So that was like the very first thing I wasn't allowed to have. And every week on my drive home from my OA meetings, I went to the frozen yogurt store in this little, I can still see it in this little strip mall and binged on frozen yogurt in my car before I got home. And by the time I got home was incredibly sick. And now I do not restrict anything like that. And I do not binge on frozen yogurt. Um, So for me, there's such a clarity in the things that I was restricting were the things that I wanted and the things that I couldn't control myself around. And that does not exist now in any way. There's no food that I can't have around me, which is not to say that I don't find them delicious. And there's not a part of me that's like, I would love to keep eating. There's a whole lot more of this, but I also have more of, it's like not coming from that primal part of my brain, which is more of that addiction of like, I need, I need, I need. I'm not even thinking. I just need, I need, I need. There's more of a presence of my whole mind there when I'm eating that food now, where it's like, this is delicious and I can appreciate that, but I'm able to say, I don't want to do that. And that's fine. Whereas the addiction to the substance would indicate that I wouldn't be able to do that. So that to me, at least for me, feels like that's possible. It's possible that what feels like a an addiction to a substance, which I believed I had, isn't, you know, isn't that. Maybe there are cases where it is, but it's definitely possible that it's not and that it's more a matter of the restriction that's driving that addiction to the behavior because you're, because you're going to get more dopamine, you're going to get more pleasure and reward out of something you're not supposed to be doing that you're doing. Like that's going to heighten that whole charge around the experience versus now where it's like that. It tastes good and there's still some reward of eating a certain food where it's like, yeah, that's good. But it's not like, ooh, it's bad. It's secret. It's, I shouldn't be. It's not that level of reward anymore. So there's something to that. And I, and I really believe that. And I um, wouldn't have believed that if I hadn't experienced it. I would have just continued touting 
the food addiction and believing that sugar was the devil and that you couldn't possibly have a bag of chips or ice cream around without eating all of it. Um, if you, if you were someone like me, you know, if you were someone who had that sort of vulnerability. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I think about it from my experience, my behaviors for me felt like the behaviors of an addict. When I was in that craving and I was in that binge mode, I would behave in ways that I would not dream of behaving otherwise. Like the lengths I would go to to get food seem like the behavior of addicts. It's what we see in, yes. you know, people like drug addicts and all these kinds of yeah. things. People struggling Dealing. with drug. Yeah, yeah, all of that, all of that. Yeah. And that also that sense of nothing else matters. It doesn't matter yes. who I'd made what promise to. Nothing else matters. The idea of it being an addiction seemed to offer a possible explanation for why I just felt like I was so broken and seemed to offer a a possibility of of hope. And because certain particular foods do um, stimulate those reward pathways more and give a bigger dopamine hit, something that I certainly found in terms of what I felt was going on in my brain is if I had been binging on my binge foods that when I went into a day where I wasn't binging my non-binge foods just I couldn't get any sense of satisfaction out of them Mm -hmm. and I feel like that was because my brain potentially had been flooded with dopamine and I wasn't just able to get that sense so the day after a binge was often uncomfortable because when I'd been binging on foods with a lot of sugar or salt, that kind of thing in. And then the next day I'm, I'm trying to have a breakfast that's going to be filling and satisfying and see me through. And let's say I have like salmon and egg on toast, something like that. I would eat it and feel completely unsatisfied. Mm. And that was really triggering. But once I accepted this cycle and I saw it, when I was coming out of a binge and I was trying to get myself back into balance, I accepted I was going to feel uncomfortable the next day and I anticipated it. I knew that, okay, tomorrow, let me try and plan in some meals that are going to be sort of more fulfilling and more nutritious to put a bit more nutrition in. It was never, I was always very careful, particularly in my recovery when I could see the rebel in me. It was not about you're not allowed those foods tomorrow, but it was about you need to get these foods in as well. You need to try and balance this back out again because you've just been eating binge foods for a couple of days. So I would wake up the next morning and I would be like, right, this is going to feel uncomfortable today. Food is not going to feel comfortable. And it didn't. But because I knew it and I accepted that uncomfortable feeling ahead of time, this is just my subjective experience. And I'm not saying that this is going to be true for everyone or maybe even anyone else. But I usually found it was just a day before those foods, my non-binge foods, started to be more appealing again. They were never appealing straight after a binge. That had to be a conscious effort to introduce those foods, to try and put in some more nutrition. And then the day after that, that was when I could start to feel the reward. So I felt like my brain would reset, but it could definitely be overloaded and flooded um, by having a lot of sugar. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. I, I always considered it like it was just such a letdown. Like the day after a binge was so much more boring in terms of food because it was like, there wasn't the high of the binge. Now there's also a low of the binge, but there's, there's so much, there's so much fun and promise in a binge. You know, it's like, there's, there's, there is a high of it. And so the next day after a binge would feel like blah. I never really thought about it in terms of satisfaction of food I think I just thought about it mentally as like I'm like I'm not binging today I have to get back on some kind of like I have to get back on the horse you know like that to me was like almost like it was just dull (laughs) (laughs) and like drudgery (laughs) but I never thought about it as as maybe food and and satiation uh, which is interesting to think about I I, yeah there's something to be said of the influx of food that is so delicious and, and sugar, sugar is rewarding. I mean, in this way, but I don't think it has to be a problem. Like, I I think that's where it gets, there's an extreme way of thinking about it where it's like, yes, I can see that. I can understand that. I can also see that the society we live in today has 
a large amount of those kinds of foods available and they're more convenient and they're cheaper and they're easier. And given the world we live in, like we're sort of set up to have them more. And that feels a little bit. And I, I personally, like, that's where I would get on board of this whole, like, don't tell me what to do. Like this whole rebellion was sort of on the flip side. I would get mad at the food industries. Like, don't force me to eat all the, you know, like I'm supposed to be eating like my grandma ate, which I just read an interesting article on that, by the way, about this whole idea of like, eat like your, your, your ancestors didn't eat this way. And it's kind of like, well, that doesn't mean they wouldn't have. So it's not to say that the, these foods don't have hyper palatable foods like that, 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 yeah, maybe they are, but it doesn't mean that it's black and white where it's like, well, then you take them out, you know, where it's like, if you have them, then you're, you're doomed because then now you're addicted to them, you know, and like, you can't stop. That's maybe the pattern that is rooted in some of the restriction around it, um, increasing the addictive behavior around it, but not necessarily that you can't have it. Be and again, it's like, well, yeah, because I, I can see that now I can see that when I have, you know, I have cookies in my house. I had some yesterday and I had two of those cookies and I, was like, that's delicious and yummy. And oh my gosh, something in me is just very excited about that. And then moved on. Like, you know, it wasn't like I hadn't, it, was, it wasn't because I introduced it that it stuck around all day. You know, it, it didn't. So there's that, you know, I just think that's something that's, well, what about that then? Like, how did all these studies fit into that experience then? You know, we talked about whether food addiction is about eating or behavior. I think there are ways of eating that can be addictive. So I, I would say the way of eating, and, and for me, there was a lot of eating to numb more than the restrictive binging for me. And that could be quite an addictive way of trying to not feel as an example. Yeah. So if I started eating foods in a certain emotional state, I couldn't control it, but I think it was much more about the emotional state I was in when I started eating that particular food than otherwise. There were times even in my binge eating day where I could eat something with sugar in and that was okay, that was fine and I could move on. It didn't turn into this catastrophic binge depending on why I'd eaten it and how comfortable I was feeling at the time. But if I was in that itchy feeling when there was something else going on, and that's when I reach for food to try and chase this feeling away that I don't like. That was when it was a whole different cycle going on. We just want to grab a moment of your time to let you know that we are now on YouTube. So if you can't wait for the next episode, we are going to be uploading the podcast onto our YouTube channel a day early. So please head over there and subscribe. We are Life After Diets podcast on YouTube and on Instagram. And you can email the show lifeafterdietspodcast at gmail.com. And if you're interested in working with me, Stephanie, I work with clients one-to-one -one, and I also am enrolling for a group program to work on intuitive eating foundations with a binge and emotional eating recovery lens. You can apply at www.iamstephaniemichelle.com backslash application. And if you want to connect with me, Sarah, I am The Binge Eating Therapist on Instagram and YouTube. And my website is thebingeeatingtherapist.com. Now let's get back to the episode. Yes. And, and I can relate to that because, okay, I just moved this past weekend. By the time this airs, it'll be a bit ago. But I've been talking about it. And it was an emotional weekend for me, leaving my old house you know, we're having kids and I don't know, just, I get when any, anything's new, I get like all rattled. So I had an emotional weekend and there were, uh, lots of, there was lots of food here. There was like a, people were bringing food, these kinds of foods, like sweets and things. And we had like more takeout and things like that. And for the times that I felt emotional, um, I could see how, at a different point in my life, that same level of emotion, once I started having those foods, I would probably not have been able to stop. Now, harder to differentiate because I was also a restrictor. Well, but I'm talking, I'm going to go back farther and went in the time when I wasn't physically restricting, just mentally, which matters. But there was more of an emotional numbing happening um, and that that was what, what was so appealing about it, why I couldn't stop. This past weekend, I had those, I had the same flood of emotion that I normally do, but I was able to stop. And that I think is more like what you're saying is about because my, well, because my restriction is also not at play anymore, both physical and mental, which matters, 
And I have done a significant amount of work on my emotional connection to food and, and, and the way that I use food to, or not, you know, to numb anymore. And so that part is now much more stable where it wasn't before. And so it's kind of a matter of, yes, the food may exacerbate that binge response when, when it's an emotional binge response. And in that sense could be seen as that addictive behavior, but it's not the root of the problem. Necess- you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like the food mm-hmm. itself isn't the problem. Um, and I think that's a distinction to, to articulate because I think there's a tendency to blame the food as the issue. And if I could just get rid of the food, I wouldn't be doing this, which to a degree could be true. Cause I remember I used to like, just keep food not around and then, but I would find my way to a binge anyway. Um, you know, so it wasn't about the food necessarily, although maybe it would catapult me in sooner and or harder or faster. Sure. And then it's a matter of deciding where you are. So I, I, I'll also talk to followers who are saying like, I'm still in the diet binge cycle. So I just, I, is it better for me to just keep the foods out of my house? Because I know I will binge. I am not healed, you know, or I'm, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not, and I use healed, you know, in quotes, mm-hmm. but like, I'm not that far along yet. So is it more dangerous for me to have them around? Cause I will use them in that way versus, you know, or do you wait until you're, you're, you know, you've gotten through some of that and then you can bring them in like what's better like what's mm-hmm. you know and I and I can appreciate that question um and it's a hard one to answer because it may render you more more vulnerable to a binge and it also may fuel the restriction <laughs> well I think that idea of for me if I started eating in a certain emotional state it was problematic so if I had the foods in the house and I was feeling those emotions and I wanted them, I would get in, my mind would get in this battle with itself where it's like, well, I've got those, I've got that chocolate in the cupboard. Mm. And I'm, I'm not supposed to be restricting myself. So that means that I should have the chocolate and then I would yeah. go and have it and I would end up having a binge. Yeah. And, and this seemed to happen over and over again. It was that confusion between exactly this, that addictive like relationship with food at the same time as trying to make sure I wasn't triggering off the restriction. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was all about, I think I might've spoken about this on an episode before, maybe I spoke about it on my YouTube channel, but about creating a gap. I needed a gap. I needed permission and I needed a gap. I needed both of those things. And I've been fortunate enough that, you know, pretty much everywhere I've lived for the last few years, I've had a shop within a few minutes walk that I could go and get foods from. And so for me at that time, it was, okay, I'm going to choose not to have them in the kitchen a few steps away. I know they're there and I can go and get them from there if I want. I did set myself these little sort of barriers, these boundaries of, okay, I have to check in with what I'm feeling. That doesn't mean I can't still go and get the food because this is where it gets like almost this mind game with myself at the time. Even if it's an emotional thing, I'm still allowed to get the food. I'm always allowed to get the food. Mm always allowed to go and and binge, have the most destructive binge, whatever it might be. That has to be an option in order for me to choose for that not to be. Sometimes I went and got myself something and sometimes I didn't, but there were still a few occasions where I did binge. And I think that was important too. Otherwise it becomes this little mind trick. And when I'm working with people with them going through the relic method, what happens is they think it's supposed to be doing these steps is supposed to be some trick to make yourself not go and get the food. Yeah. And if you believe that, the part of your brain that believes that will not let you stop and reflect and ask what's going on. That's yeah. why the permission part has to be there. Otherwise it doesn't work. You can't explore the emotional aspect unless it's not also an option because your brain just won't let you do it. Yeah. It doesn't want to do it. Yeah, that reminds me of, um, I used to, when I was in college, I had a therapist for my eating disorder and I would go to the center of, town and I would have the session with him and I loved those sessions actually but they were always very triggering to me um and next door was a Dunkin Donuts and I would finish the session and pass the Dunkin Donuts and nine times out of ten would go in and I would have those big fat-free muffins (laughs) that was you know during again this is 90s early 2000s so I would order them and I would binge on them on my walk back to my car. And then, and it became 
this thing where I was like, I can't, once I had a bite of, they were very sugary, you know, they're fat free, so they're even more sugary. And I couldn't stop once I had one. But that one time out of 10 that I didn't go to the Dunkin' Donuts, I would go back to my dorm and I might be okay. So I would think about that and I would like, well, like me, is it, the muffin, you know, like, is it the having the sugary muffin like that? Of course, I wasn't thinking of it sugar in that time, but I was just thinking the binge food, like does the binge food itself perpetuate the binge? Or is there a way that like, if I don't have the binge food, then I'm not binging. Like what sense to make of that? So I used to, so I would bring that story back to my therapist who said, okay, well, the mission's going to be to not stop at Dunkin' Donuts. He would come up with way, like go the other way out of the building, this whole thing. The second that happened, that we talked about it, and it was like, well, the goal is to not have it. Guess what? Like, <laughs> that's like, it's like, I'm going. And there was no pause because the mission became different. The mission wasn't about, I don't want to emotionally eat right now because I'm triggered by this therapy session. It was, I'm not supposed to, so I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, like it was just, it was, the whole motivation behind it was different just by bringing it up. So it just, to me, like I think of it because it's like the permission has to be from inside of you. And also the desire to have something or not have, not have something has to be about taking care of yourself in this way. Because once psychology comes into it, then there's a rebellion factor that can look a lot like an addiction fact, you know, that can fuel this thing. And, and, um, I think it's all of these things are so weaved that it's really hard to to see them as separate. Um, but doing, I do my, I try to do my best to to pull those things apart and like see what is really at play here that looks like one thing, but it's actually something else. To kind of clarify this very complicated topic uh, a little bit more. When you talked about that, it just reminded me of some of the backlash binges. I've had after attempts to give up sugar and any time that I'd gone I don't know a week or more than a week it would be a month two months of binging off the back of that and I've had people say this to me and people will write to me when I've spoken about OA before and they'll say OA made my binging worse and then sometimes I'll get someone they'll message me and they'll be like OA saved my life great we've got a we're just here to talk about our experience and talk about what we see and I'm open for people to take anything that works for them but I feel that for again I'm so cautious about making these sweeping generalizations but I feel like from what I've seen the majority of people um, it does more harm than good to see sugar as or see themselves as having a sugar addiction also with OA I mean I've maybe it's different on different chapters, but there's an idea that if you gain weight, that you're a band, that you're, you're, you're not respecting yourself and you're not taking care of yourself. Um, and I've heard this from people who have come to me for coaching after going to OA and having, and, and in the middle of our coaching, there's friends that were made in these OA programs. And this person was saying to me, I feel like I feel so much more free with food than I've ever felt that I ever felt with OA. Like it, it couldn't give me that, but I have gained weight and my OA friends are, they, they're pitying me. But, but meanwhile, um, you know, the OA friends were also very much restricting and it was obvious to her. And she was saying they're, she's, they're so afraid of food still. And I don't feel that way anymore, but I feel like I've failed because I've gained the weight and um, almost like the addiction model was used as you fell into your addiction, like you gave into it and you gained weight to show that. Definitely the weight stigma in OA, I think was, was enormous. Weight loss was highly celebrated. This was, I mean, when I was going here, this would have been 2011, 2012. So of course that was a decade ago. So I don't know whether they've moved on. And back then, you know, I hadn't heard of any kind of weight acceptance. The first person who told me about weight acceptance was someone from OA I remember where I was when I was on the phone to her, she was going, yeah, and there's this, there's like a group of people who are, they're talking about fat acceptance, that you just accept your fat. And and, and like, I remember her horror and I can remember me as well at the time. Oh gosh, who would, who would do that? You know, it was so ingrained in me, the possibility of another way. And on that note, I do think it's worth a shout out. So recently I went and I checked out 
Eating Disorders Anonymous. So this is a, a fairly newish branch, I think, of the 12-step program. I want to say 10-step program then, 12-step program. I don't know which steps I'm cutting out. And their whole focus is not abstinence, it's balance. And I've only been to yeah. one meeting and like any of these, they can vary from meeting to meeting. And it was just what they call a topic meeting. So it was sharing. There was no readings from the big book. So I don't know what their big book sounds like. But what I really loved was they did a section where people shared their small wins. And it was lovely. It was people sharing things around boundaries and just I don't want to say any details of anybody, but these mm. small things that were just these positive steps. And it was so against the black and white thinking that I always felt was very much present from my experience of OA. Mm. So I was really pleasantly surprised. And I would, you know, for anyone who's really, really feeling alone in this and wants to connect with people to maybe try it out, because they're all online now. So there's one starting almost every hour somewhere in the world. Mm. And you can just hop on and, um, and connect. And the nice thing about being online as well, you can have your camera off. You know, you can change your yeah. name. You can, you don't have to be seen yeah. in the same way as when you show up to an in-person meeting which I think helps the privacy perspective yeah. and people feeling safe I also want to say because I feel like it's important and it comes up in my mind when I talk about this topic so I think about sometimes I'm like well I naturally have a gravitational pull towards foods that are quote unquote healthy right so I learned through my clean eating years, a lot of recipes and I, I stocked my pantry in such a way that I actually liked a lot of it. Um, and so I landed now and, and I also have a strong inclination towards sugars and carbohydrates. Like I like that too. And I sometimes think about like, well, if I hadn't ever had that, if I didn't have the inclination to eat this quote unquote, these healthy foods as well, would balance feel harder for me? You know, like would, would I have just stayed in the sugar and carbs and like stocked my pantry full of like cookies and only cookies, whereas now I have cookies and I also have, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and, you know, like, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I want to just say that like, that that's something, but also that there's a way of eating intuitively or um, being in recovery where there's this appreciation of nutrition as well that isn't pathological that doesn't mean that you're in a diet mentality or you're in a you know you're, you're either having cookies or you're having healthy food that there's a way to exist with both and that maybe that that balance itself is what perpetuates more balance itself I don't know how it would have looked if I didn't have that natural inclination and I, I try to remember that sometimes um, or I do remember that when I have clients who feel who tell me I hate vegetables you know mm -hmm. like I just don't even like them and can I still trust that my body will get to a place of wanting them because I don't know if it ever will it never did and that's a different you know that's something to, to think about also in the the intentional injection of vegetables or, or something like vegetables with more nutrient dense foods um, can be a place where it, it is maybe intentional. Maybe your body doesn't naturally incline itself that way. And you can get to a place that where it feels safe to do that. Um, but that, that might be a different way of experiencing it. It may inform some of the conversation around what food addiction can feel like if you don't have a, a, another, if, if your body doesn't naturally want the other side of that equation, it may feel easier to stick to the sugars and the carbs that feel like they just keep rewarding that that center if there's not something else that happens that that balances that out mm -hmm. be careful about using these words but do you know what i'm saying do you, am i communicating yeah. this so i think that's what would happen to me as i was talking about before when i was coming out of a binge it wasn't because i was suddenly now craving the more nutrient dense foods i wasn't if i just carried on checking in and going what what am i actually drawn to at this time it would have been more of my binge foods. So it was this kind of conscious decision to introduce these foods. And okay. I find that when I'm eating more of those foods, I want more of those foods. And when I'm eating more of what I would call, I'm now gonna call them my old binge foods because they're not my binge foods now. I want more of those old binge foods though. Yeah, There is, I don't feel like I'm naturally inclined. So I don't, that is an issue that I have with the intuitive eating sometimes this idea that if you just give yourself permission around all these foods eventually your body is just going to want 
is just going to start yeah. craving those nutrient dense yeah. foods. I don't think that's the case. And I think of it as well. This is again, just my theory based on my layman's knowledge of biology is around what's going on in our gut. So yeah. our gut, like bacteria and microbiomes, they shift according to what we've been eating. If you're mm -hmm. someone who never eats lentils and you eat a whole load of lentils, you're going to experience some discomfort because it's when people get gassy and stuff like that. But if you eat lentils all the time, you don't have yeah. that reaction because your microbiome has shifted. Right. And I think that's what happens. So when I'm eating or when I was eating like a load of my my binge foods or eating more sugar even now if I've I don't know let's say I've been away somewhere and I tend to be eating more of those kinds of foods than I might if I'm just at home sorting myself out I find I, I want more of those foods those cravings linger and so it's a very conscious decision to be no I need to bring in more of those other foods get mm -hmm. those in and that helps to kind of balance me out but I, it's not about going oh I can't I mustn't eat those foods because right. I've eaten them at the weekend, but it's like, oh, I'm feeling a bit out of balance here. I yeah. have to go for right. these foods. But that is a mental decision. Yeah. That is not something that is intuitively being craved, yeah. I think, at my body level. Right. Whereas I have the different, I actually do crave. Um, I will crave a big, like a big salad, like with all the stuff. Oh yeah, I will crave it. But I'm, I think it's a responsibility of intuitive eating coaches, counselors, therapists, or dietitians to recognize that that might not always be. And I've been, I've been conscious about that because, um, I also, you know, I've trained as a health coach and this is why I run groups on gentle nutrition, because once you get over the hump of restriction, there's some, for some people, the, that desire, that inclination towards the nutrient dense food, that's another, uh, clean eating term, but for lack of a better word, um, doesn't necessarily present itself and it can be brought in. And there's nothing wrong with that. It can be intentionally brought in. And there is so much feeling of like, is that restriction? Is that dieting? You know, and I think it's like a disservice, you know, it's like, no, let's bring it in, in a way that feels supportive because that's not the way it's ever been brought in before, but that it can be a really important part of the intuitive eating path. Um, and I think it's important to state that because um, I think, I think, I think everyone's different and I, and that, that, that might be a place where intuitive eating misses that that conversation sometimes. And for someone who's not going to, who understands in their soul that they're like, I'm not going to crave a salad. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, what do I do now? You know, am I just going to be left eating all, all of these fun foods all the time? Um, that no, there's, there's a way to, to non-restrictively bring those in. And like you're saying, like to, and to balance that equation a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My concluding thoughts I think around the food addiction side of it, I think the term is problematic and difficult to define. I think we can have addictive patterns around eating and around certain kinds of foods. But I think that the most important thing when it comes to trying to understand your experience when you're struggling is understanding it in a way that presents you with a way out. And I think for most people looking at it as a food addiction does not present a feasible way out. And from personal experience and, and working with people as well who have felt that out of control, who have felt like addicts around food, discovering that balance is possible. It feels like it's not because it feels so far out of reach. For me, feels like the place to start. And I, I just want people to feel free. And if for someone actually they say, do you know what, treating it as an, as an addiction and cutting out these foods has made me feel freer than when I was in it, then great. That's all I want for anybody is to find some freedom from this. And also presenting the idea that we all, we all have to do what we have to do to feel safe with food first. And that sometimes having certain foods can be too triggering and overwhelming. And if we don't have the tools to cope with that at this point, then avoiding them may be the safest option or the best option for you. Um, and also may fuel the restriction that fuels the binge eating. So having an awareness of both sides of this I think is really, really important instead of deciding I'm going to sit on this side of the fence or on this side of the fence. Cause I think that there's perspective, both perspectives have validity just depending on where a person is. So 
to try not to attach too much to food is addictive for me or food is um, in no way addictive and you should just eat it. So there's so much context and to recognize that the personal application of all those con contexts are relevant to navigating this in a way that feels manageable. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> so do we mention anything again here? I don't think so. I just the how to connect with the show. That's it. Okay. All right, everybody, if you'd like to connect with the show or have any questions about what we talked about today or anything else to say, you can find us at Life After Diets Podcast on Instagram and Life After Diets Podcast at gmail.com. And